Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Build. I'm your host, Carrie Justick. There are currently 30 million people enslaved worldwide within industries that profit nearly $150 billion a year off of human trafficking. If those numbers sound big and those words intimidating, you're not alone. In fact, they deterred Blythe Hill from getting involved in anti-trafficking efforts for quite some time until her fervor to do something about it would align with a fun fashion challenge she had started called Dress Ember. That same challenge is now something that thousands of advocates around the world take part in in order to raise money and awareness to stop human trafficking. Please welcome Blythe Hill. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're both here in our dresses for Dress Ember. Um, but before we get into all of that, I just want to learn a bit about you, where you're from, what you liked when you were younger, and a little bit about your interest in fashion before any of this started. Sure. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, moved to Orange County, California in high school, and um, I have always been interested in fashion. I love styling and interior design and um, just the, the opportunity to use fashion as a vehicle for self-expression. So um, I didn't study fashion in college. I ended up studying English because I also I love to write. Um, so it's a little bit funny to me that I landed in mm -hmm. fashion slash the nonprofit world since that's not my background. Um, but it's been exciting to me to learn as I go at the same time. Definitely. Um, and I know a lot of the time in your origin story of Dress Ember, you talk about first hearing about human trafficking in around 2005. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about that. When you first heard about it, where you were, what context, and maybe about where you then went to research it more. Yeah, I was in college the first time I learned about human trafficking, and I, I stumbled across a news article um, that was a story out of India, um, and it was about sex trafficking. And I had never heard the term sex trafficking or human trafficking at that time, and I was just horrified. I could not believe that slavery was not only still happening in the world, but that it was happening on the scale and in the forms that it is. Um, and so I, I kind of did a deep dive and, and went online, tried to find out as much as I could, find out what organizations were um, working to combat this issue. And um, I felt this immediate sense of urgency to do something about it. Um, this like intense, fiery passion all of a sudden that I had never felt before. Um, and almost immediately, I felt an immediate sense of powerlessness as well, because it felt like, okay, there are a few very specific ways to engage in this issue. And they didn't line up with who I am or who the direction I saw myself going. It was like, okay, well, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social worker or a lawyer or a cop. So what can I do about this? And again, as a student with not a lot of resources, money, influence, um, I just felt really powerless. And I sort of thought like, okay, I guess there's nothing I can do about this. Maybe maybe one day I'll have a job where I can give a significant amount, but that's kind of the best I thought I could hope for, which was really um, frustrating for a long time. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting and what definitely comes through when you research this is you talk about how you first heard about sex trafficking, which I think is something that a lot of us hear about, um, and that's what makes it feel a little more distant. But there are are multiple different types and a lot more that are, I mean, all of them are pretty close to home when we don't even realize it. Um, but with sex exploitation, there's a personal experience that you've had that you've shared on stages in, in everything that has to do with your organization. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit and just opening up about being molested as a child. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't get easier to talk about or to say. So were you ever hesitant about sharing that personal connection to this or did you just immediately think it was super important? You know, early on, I took for granted that I felt so passionate about it and I thought, okay, everyone must feel this passionate about this. This is so outrageous. And surely if, if everyone knew this was happening, they would you know, be up at arms and ready to do something about it. And I, 
I realized later on that, oh, the reason I feel so strongly about this is because of my own experience of sexual abuse. And um, so at that point, I decided, okay, this is important for me to talk about because this is this is why I care about this and people need to know that. And, and unfortunately, one in three people can identify with my story. Um, and so initially it was... It, it felt like something that took some courage to talk about and to share. Um, but then surprisingly, it's gotten actually much easier. Um, and I think that speaks to the power that, that shame can have over us that, um, you know, when we're ashamed and I think when there's sexual abuse, we carry a sense of shame and a sense of responsibility for what's happened to us. Um, but when we shine a light on our shame, you know, we think it's like the scariest thing to do because we think like, oh, people are going to judge me. People are going to see me a certain way. Um, but actually a lot of people relate. A lot of people have a lot of empathy. And so the shame that I felt just began to lose all its power. Um, and I, yeah, it's it's actually like really empowering for me to talk about it now, which is a total 180. Um, and it's been really healing in my journey to realize, you know, in order at 19 reading about sex trafficking in order to say like, oh, that's wrong. That's mm -hmm. so wrong. What's happening to those women. I kind of also had to say, that's also wrong. What happened to me? You know, like I, it, it was this very, um, re redemptive thing for me that, that, um, I could sort of identify with millions of women and girls and also make this declaration that, across the board, sexual abuse is wrong. It's not the fault of, of women and girls, and it's not my fault that that happened to me. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, seeing you talk about it, I could tell that it's super empowering, and it is such an important part of the story. Um, but then, of course, in 2009, that's when your December challenge started, and it didn't really have anything to do with anti-trafficking. So can you tell us a little bit about the or origin story of the challenge? Yeah, so I was still in college, and honestly, I was bored. Um, I was just, I was an English major, so I was just buried in books and felt really, like, creatively stifled by the academic routine and rigor, and I thought, okay, I, I need a creative outlet, but I have no time. You know, I had no time to, like, I like to, like, make things and craft and bake and use my hands, and I just had no time for any of that, and I thought, okay, well, I have to get dressed every day, um, so why don't I use that as a way to in infuse creativity into my day. And I came up with the idea to try wearing a dress every day for a month. It happened to be November of 2009 when I had the idea. And so I was like, okay, the next full month is December. I'll wear only dresses in December. And I love puns. And I came up with the name December and was like, okay, that's too good. I have to do it. Um, and then I, I did it. I wore a dress every day for the month of December and, and never planned on doing it again. It was, um, it was fun, but it was never intended to be an annual thing. Um, but then the next year, some of my girlfriends wanted to join in. Totally thought they must be bored as well. <laughs> but I was like, okay, let's do it. And then the next year, some of their girlfriends wanted to join in. And so at that point, when it was um, women I didn't know personally, I thought, okay, this isn't just my friends humoring me. This is a good idea people like this. Um, I joke that I have a lot of bad ideas that never go anywhere. And so it was really easy to recognize a good idea that was moving beyond my immediate circle. And that's when I started to dream about what more it could be and adding a layer to it and a heart and a cause. Um, and so two years later in 2013 is when I aligned a dress number with anti-human trafficking. And then in, through that process is when you partnered with IJM. Um, and so that's something I also want to touch upon for people that want to get involved in something or even align something they're doing with a cause. How, where do you even begin? How did you find this specific organization? And how did you contact them and say, hey, I have this fun idea, but I want to turn it into something more impactful? Yeah, I did a lot of research online and through talking to people that I respected and people who were plugged into the anti-trafficking space and just kept hearing about International Justice Mission. Um, they're the world's largest and leading anti-trafficking organization. They have something like 18 offices in 15 countries. Um, and the more I learned about them, the more I respected what they were doing and... Um, 
and not just in the trafficking space, but in the overall nonprofit space, they're really um, setting the tone for impact measurement. They do a really amazing job of measuring, like they do baseline tests before they begin any work in a community, and then they do annual um, tests for prevalency and for convictions, and um, they just do an amazing job measuring impact all the way through. So I think I what I did was I posted on Facebook, does anyone know anyone at IJM? And I got, um, I ended up with like four or five different contacts. Um, and just emailed all of them and said who I was and how I got their, their contact info, um, told them my idea. And what was super interesting is two of the contacts that I got were pretty high up in the organization. They were like uh, VP level contacts. And then two of the contacts were, um, I don't want to say lower level, but more like entry level, like it was an executive assistant and a writer. Um, and everyone responded, which was amazing. They were all like, oh, you know, they responded positively. They were like, oh, this is a really neat idea. Let us know how it goes kind of thing. Um, and then kind of behind the scenes, those two people who were in lower positions really got it and ran with it. And they took it to the director of social media and then came back to me and said, great news. Like, we love your idea. And we took it to our social media director. He loves it. And we want to help promote it. Um, and when that happened, I pretty much just like hit the floor. I was like just so amazed because their audience at that time was like 200,000 people across the world who obviously are plugged into this issue. Um, so I really attribute a lot of the success to to that and their immediate enthusiasm for the idea. Um, and I think for anyone who's starting something out, um, looking for partnerships and looking for ways to collaborate with like-minded people, brands, organizations is really, I mean, that's, um, when I look back, that ended up being a really powerful move for, for us. And the one thing that you're mentioning a lot is obviously social media, which plays a huge part in this. Um, did you, did you know that that would be your immediate outlet? Was that the way that you initially spread the word? Was it word of mouth? Like, and now what role has social media played in this challenge? Social media has been huge for us. Like to this day, Instagram is our primary channel. Um, hashtags have been really important in just like unifying uh, our community and uh, the community of people who are plugged into this issue and also getting new people to kind of join in on it. But initially, um, Instagram was fairly new. Like, I, I think I made an account in 2011. Um, in 2013, I was lucky enough to, you know, ha get the dress number handle first and um, got it on Twitter and Facebook. And I was just sort of curious uh, about what it could do for us. And I had no idea that it was going to be so powerful for us. But yeah, in retrospect, it's been, it's been our main shtick. And then there was one thing that you wrote actually on your Instagram the other day. You said awareness is underrated. Um, and that really stuck with me because I think especially with some social media campaigns, people think like, what is awareness going to do? What is wearing a dress going to do? Um, but that's really at the heart of what your organization is about. And it really has proven to work. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how awareness works? Yeah, there's a great quote from Gary Haugen, who's the CEO and founder of International Justice Mission. He said, awareness alone is not going to solve this problem or any problem, but any solution certainly begins with awareness. Like it has to start with knowing and then that leads to caring, which leads to action. Um, and it is, it's true. Um, and December is this like really fun, light, easy way to engage people in an issue that might be intimidating or that might be too heavy. Um, and it's, it's hard. Um, you know, we have, we have a number of celebrities who join in with Dress Ember, um, and just within the last few days, Debbie Ryan posted about Dress Ember and this beautiful photo of her in this striking dress. And then I was sort of reading through the comments and a lot of comments were positive. Like most of them were positive. And then like a few were like, well, what is like, what is wearing a dress really going to do? And like, you should just donate money. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was hard and it led to my caption the next day of like, awareness is so important um, because again, people need to know in order to care, in order to give and, and do something about it. 
Um, and also, y- you know, people look at Dressember and again, they think like, oh, well, what is this really going to do? And I suppose in the early days, I was among the most skeptical. I was like, is this going to work? We're just getting dressed. You know, we're not running a marathon. Um, but we have raised five million do- over $5 million in five years. And so clearly it's working. Um, and I think because it's so easy and fun and it's um, disarming, you know, it's this non-threatening, really light way to engage in a really heavy, dark issue. Um, and so thousands of people who feel the way that I felt, which is passionate but powerless, mm-hmm. you know, they might be a stay-at-home mom, they might work on Wall Street, whatever their job, you have to get dressed in the morning, I would hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's this opportunity to ch- use something that you do every day as a way to uh, bring attention to this issue and, and raise some money. So. That's amazing. And I just, everything on your platform makes it super easy to engage in the topic too. And looking at your social media, your website, everything like that, you really break it down and it is less intimidating because for somebody like myself who doesn't know much, I'm able to learn through your platform. I'm not walking in and expected to know everything about the subject. Um, But from your end, when did you kind of feel comfortable enough to then start educating other people on it? Because I feel like it probably took a long time to do your research, learn what you needed to know, and then to turn around and say, okay, I can kind of go out and speak about it now. Yeah, I would say it's been an ongoing journey. um, And I... I love learning. And so I love being able to continuously learn. And this is a, a, a field where there is continuous research. Um, and so I just, I just share what I'm learning as I'm learning it. Um, for instance, over the last year or so, it's been really eye opening to learn that in the U S uh, trafficking absolutely exists in the U S the majority of those trafficked are U S citizens. So we might have this perception of, you know, people are coming in from other or being trafficked from other countries. Um, but the majority are U S citizens and of those sex trafficked in the U S something like 80 to 90% of specifically women and girls sex trafficked in the U S are, or were in the foster care industry. So seeing, learning about this shocking overlap between foster care and trafficking has been super eye-opening. Um, it's led us to partner with a foster care advocacy organization called Olive Crest on the West Coast um, as part of our prevention strategy. Um, and so that's one way that I, I kind of continue to learn and just share because I'm, I'm, I know that if I'm just learning about these things, chances are a lot of other people don't know about these things either. So just taking, not taking that for granted that, okay, there's, there's so much information, there's so much research and, um, and there's so many myths around trafficking too. Like people think, um, I think because of the film Taken and because of, uh, different news stories that get a lot of attention. People think like kidnapping is the primary form of recruitment into trafficking. And it, that actually is a pretty small uh, small percentage of recruitment happens through kidnapping. A lot of it in the U.S. is um, through manipulation and coercion. It's um, sort of pseudo-romantic relationships um, where a girl thinks that her trafficker is her boyfriend slash father, you know, just really um, mentally, emotionally insidious. One of the ways that I found I connected with it was through fashion, um, which I think is so interesting because just hearing about the origin of your organization, it started with a dress and now it's kind of coming full circle. And with your annual dress collection, you're really creating opportunities for more ethical labor practices, giving women jobs where they can create clothing. And so to see that there are so many fast fashion brands and places within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. um, where fashion is really made by people who are being trafficked into the industry. Um, So can you explain a little bit about that and then also how it came full circle for you with Dress Ember? Yeah, I learned pretty early on in Dressember the overlap between labor trafficking and the apparel industry. And that was also really eye-opening. And it became very quickly part of our mission to educate people about that. Because the last thing we want to encourage is this unfortunate 
irony of like here I'm advocating for for freedom and for the dignity of all people, but I'm wearing this ten dollar dress that you know someone was violently exploited to make. Um, and so yeah, a big part of what we do is we really we don't we don't try to shame people for shopping fast fashion or, or even those brands, but we try to educate people on the reality of what's going on beyond behind the scenes that, um, the majority of garment industry workers are women and girls, um, that they're, even when they're paid a, a small wage, there's often violence, there's often, um, labor violations, um, and, and so then we try to really spotlight ethical brands, brands that are just doing an amazing job ensuring a clean supply chain, ensuring that people, every person who touches their product is treated fairly and with dignity. Um, and four years ago, we launched um, our first dress ember dress. It was one dress in 2014. Um, and now this year's collection is eight dresses, um, eight different styles designed by eight different powerhouse ladies. Um, this is one of them designed by uh, celebrity stylist Penny Lovell. Um, and these dresses are handmade, ethically made by survivors of trafficking in Nepal. Um, I actually got to visit the sewing center outside of Kathmandu this past summer, and it was just beautiful. And every time I think about that part of what we're doing, I just, I get so excited because the potential there is amazing. Um, there's about 16 women who work in the sewing center and there's a waiting list of 500 women who want to work in the sewing center. Um, so my dream is, you know, the more demand we can create for dresses, the more jobs we can create for those survivors. And, um, you know, I used to think that the most important things for a survivor or for a victim of trafficking were rescue and restoration, mm -hmm. um, trauma therapy. And those are super critical, but equally vital in the process of healing is a dignified job. Like often it was for want of a job that a person fell into trafficking to begin with. Um, there's a lot of like fake job schemes that are recruitment strategies for trafficking and especially from Nepal to India, just a very poor country. Um, thousands of women and girls go into India thinking that they're gonna have a job as a, as a cleaner or as a um, nanny or a maid of some kind or a cook and it ends up being um, that they're sex trafficked. Um, so when we can create economic opportunity, we can actually safeguard them from falling into trafficking again, which is another problem. So awesome. And then before we head to audience Q&A, I just want to talk a little bit about your dress because I know that you have your own little twist on the December, the Dress Ember Challenge this year. So can you tell everybody a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the things I hear every year is like, oh, I would participate in Dress Ember except I only own one dress or I only own three dresses. Um, so last year I wore the same black dress all month and just styled it differently every day. And it was super fun. Um, this year I wanted to give a little more stage time to some of our other dresses. So I'm wearing a different dress every week. So this is week one. I'm on day four of wearing the penny dress and just styling it differently. And we're posting my daily outfits on the dress number, uh, Instagram, as well as on my personal Instagram. I love it. I was telling her I'm getting some fashion inspo from watching. So thank you so much. Um, audience Q&A, who's up first? Hi. Um, so we have an online question from our website. Nikki wants to know, what has been your biggest takeaway from starting this movement? Um, that's a great question. My biggest takeaway... Um, you know, I think something that continues to strike me is, if I'm honest, I aligned Dress Ember with anti-trafficking because I was looking for a way for myself to engage in this issue in a significant way. And what I ended up creating was this pathway for thousands of other people. Last year, we had 8,000 people register and become Dress Ember advocates. And men, too. We've had a lot of men wear ties or some brave men wear dresses or kilts. Um, and so that's been amazing to see, okay, this really resonates with people. People care about this issue, and they're looking for a tangible way, a way to take action. Um, and I've created that, which is amazing <laughs> and humbling. And then I think we have one more. 
Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, what are some of the future plans that you have for December? Um, yeah, good question. So this year we added nine new grant partners. Um, so we were a fundraising campaign, and then in, in the new year we give grants to our grant partners. So last year we had three partners, um, two international and one domestic. And this year we have we still have our two international partners, and we have 10 total domestic partners. And so it's been really amazing to be able to partner with these new organizations and know that through participating in Dressember, people are going to have a local impact and an international impact. And so that's something I look forward to in the future is continuing to build this, both the community of advocates and brands that are coming alongside Dressember, and then also um, this network of organizations through which we can have a huge impact and organizations that are working to dismantle traffic from every angle, so prevention on the foster care side and training with um, like hospitality and medical and transportation um, people and um, and then obviously through rescue and restoration and, and aftercare and job creation. So I get really excited about the future of our impact and really developing a holistic um, impact. It's so exciting because on your website, um, you even have like a little timeline of where you guys have started and just like every year, diff the numbers are growing, the people participating, the organizations joining you. Um, so I can't even imagine how exciting that is for you. But before we go, can you just tell everybody a little bit about how they can still get involved in Dress Ember this year? Yeah, absolutely. It is not too late to join in. Um, we have people join in as late as, I mean, really any time in December. And, and our campaign stays open through the end of January because January is National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, so you can join in at any time. And it's absolutely not too late right now. Um, so you just go to dressember.org and create a free campaign page in a matter of minutes. You obviously commit to wearing either a dress or a tie every day during December. And then you tell everyone in your life, this is what I'm doing and why I care about it. And I'm trying to raise X amount um, because I'm hoping to have X impact. Mm -hmm. And if you want to help me hit my goal, here's my link. We make it super easy to share on social media or via email or even in conversation with people. They can just go to the website and look up your name to find you. And you'll find that people want to support you mm -hmm. in what you're passionate about. And again, people think it's fun and it's positive, it's light. And um, so 95% of people respond really positively to it and want to support it. Um, and even if you don't raise any money, having conversations and raising awareness and dispelling myths about it is so important. And you never know what that conversation is going to lead to in that person's life. That's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Give it up for Blythe. Thank you. Thanks for having me.